Hi, everyone. Welcome to Unchained, your no hype resource for all things crypto. I'm your host, Laura Shin. Want to show your love for Unchained? Check out our t-shirts, mugs, hats, and stickers at shop.unchainedpodcast.com. Again, that's shop.unchainedpodcast.com. Kraken is the best exchange in the world for buying and selling digital assets. It has the tightest security, deep liquidity, and a great fee structure with no minimum or hidden fees. Whether you're looking for a simple fiat on-ramp or futures trading, Kraken is the place for you. Cypher Trace cutting-edge cryptocurrency intelligence powers anti-money laundering, blockchain analytics, and threat intel. Leading exchanges, virtual currency businesses, banks, and regulators themselves use CypherTrace to comply with regulation and to monitor compliance. Crypto.com, the crypto super app that lets you buy, earn, and spend crypto in one place. Get a metal MCO Visa card with up to 5% back on all your spending. Download the Crypto.com app today. Today's guest is Brendan Ike, CEO and President of Brave. Welcome, Brendan. Thanks for having me. You are famous for creating JavaScript and co-founding Mozilla. Tell us about your history prior to founding Brave. Well, let's see. Uh, I used to work on operating systems and network software, low-level software for Silicon Graphics back in its heyday in 85 to 92. And then I I went to a company that was like uh, second grad school that you never heard of called MicroUnity, where I did a bunch of similar low-level hardware on amazing uh, software on amazing hardware. And then I went to Netscape uh, a year after they invited me, <laughs> which was my mistake. But I went there in 1995, uh, created JavaScript in 10 days because everybody was in a big hurry to do a deal with Sun to embed Java in Netscape and kill Windows, to quote Mark Andreessen. And that got Microsoft's attention. It got Microsoft's attention in such a bad way that they crushed Netscape and Microsoft ended up in an antitrust case they lost, and uh, Netscape ejected Mozilla as sort of an escape pod uh, with just a, a couple of us on board, a small handful of people. And we persevered and did Firefox, restarted the browser market. Uh, and over the course of time, I realized that the monopoly uh, position had changed who was playing the monopolist, but it was still a risk in the internet. Whenever you have networks, you can have uh, people cluster around a service or a distribution uh, channel like the PC's operating system uh, becomes a monopoly control point. And you end up with uh, Microsoft in the 90s, or uh, now I would say Google, uh, first among many. Facebook also has a lot of power. Uh, taking over large parts of markets and then using that power to conquer adjacent markets. So while I was uh, doing Mozilla, I also realized Mozilla was really uh, dependent on on Google for its revenue. And I thought, couldn't we do something that put the user in in the first position for controlling the revenue, getting the revenue, sending it to their favorite sites? And that's why I created Brave. And also, I just want to cycle back a little bit there was a period where you did become CEO of Mozilla. It was pretty short. Controversy caused you to step down. What happened there? I can't talk about that for uh, a lot of reasons. Uh, but it, when I was at Mozilla, I was ultimately running engineering over 430 people, I think, and uh, stepped up to the opportunity when they couldn't find a CEO candidate uh, otherwise. Uh, but there were difficulties, I, I, again, I can't comment on, and it was important to be able to do the things that we're doing at Brave without the constraints that I think Mozilla faced at the time. Uh, so I did that. Oh, okay. Well, just for the listeners, so they're not confused, um, I guess shortly after you began, people became aware, partly through a campaign by OkCupid, that you had donated to uh, Proposition 8, which was to um, ban gay marriage in California, and that caused enough of a controversy that eventually you had to step down. Um, so tell me a little bit more about how you came to found Brave and what your motivation was. As I said, it was uh, uh, watching Mozilla uh, be a, a junior search partner with Google, which was the main source of revenue for Mozilla and still is, uh, and realizing Google was not just going to stay an excellent search engine, which is how the partnership started in 2004. 
uh, after uh, we did the deal in 2004 and started making a lot of money, Google bought YouTube. They bought DoubleClick, which is you know the basis for the, the ad exchange and how they do ads in publisher pages. And then they, they bought other companies and they unified the ad exchange across all of their media, across search, across the publisher pages, across the Google Play Store for Android, uh, and across YouTube. Uh, and then they, you know, they, they made it so that all your data belonged to them. It, it, even to the point people didn't realize this at first, ProPublica reported on it in 2016, that Chrome is tracking you. If you use any Google service and you log in with your Google account ID, unless you turn off the tracking, you're giving data every time you use Chrome with such a logged in service. You don't have to log into the browser now. That Since last year, they changed it so that just using the service logs you into the browser across all your tabs. So this is what, you know, Joshana Zuoff calls surveillance capitalism. I don't know the term's not original to her. This is uh, something that uh, I think a lot of people don't uh, want to see unchallenged because, you know, you perceive it many ways. You're, you're tracked by ads that bother you. Uh, maybe they're they're targeting ads that you've already responded to by buying the product, in which case there's no point. That's just annoying. Or they're they're targeting you with ads that you don't for things you don't want, or they're disclosing that your children's birthday gifts ahead of schedule, or they're being used for outright malign purposes like malware distribution, um, malevolent stuff, uh, spying on you, uh, harassing you. Uh, maybe they're also being used, this is the other side of the system, where you're not involved, but the advertiser is spending money that's going to a fraud uh, system that pretends to view the ad when it's really just a robot, software robot in a cloud browser. Uh, so there are a lot of problems with this system. When when Google bought DoubleClick, uh, the judge supervising the acquisition through a consent decree said, you have a search business, you've just bought a display ads business, you should not arbitrage those two markets. You're going to have instant price knowledge for a bunch of brands that are buying keywords for search and they're buying you know segments, what they call segment identifiers or basically uh, keywords for display ads. And uh, since you have instant price knowledge, you can make risk-free profit. You shouldn't do that. But the consent decree expired after two years and Google unified the ad exchange. It, it isn't just arbitrage. It's now a, a panopticon. And uh, th this, is, this is something that I think is a problem for everybody. Publishers face not only the fraud uh, problem I mentioned where they don't get the re remnant, the residual ad revenue share because the, the there's no viewer looking at their site. It's a robot looking at a copy of their site, but the advertiser still pays. Uh, advertisers uh, don't like that as much, but they, they kind of have to turn a blind eye because they're throwing money at the wall and seeing what sticks. Publishers also are at the end of the payment pipe, so they get whatever is left in the pie tin. And sometimes it's only one small slice. It's like 20% or 30% of the gross revenue spend. And there are other problems, but the social problems become even worse. People uh, you know, worry about things like Cambridge Analytica, and I think there's something to it. The amount of data leakage when you use these kind of ad systems is horrifying. You don't know when you go to a page without protection like Brave Shields offers where your data is going. It could be going to a bunch of partners of partners, sort of seven degrees of Kevin Bacon separated from the Google or, or the, the other ad exchange operator. And it again, it can be used for, for very bad purposes. So how does Brave work? So browsers for a long time just were sort of the user's agent in, in the, the software sense that they would do whatever you said when you clicked on a link or opened a new tab. But I created JavaScript, and even before that, with cookies and images, there were ways to track you. So what happened over time is a system of, of surveillance evolved, kind of unplanned, based on these, these fundamental building blocks, the cookie, the image, and JavaScript. And if you don't block those by default, you're not just a, a user agent as a browser. You're sort of a blind servant of the advertising tracking uh, system. So Brave blocks all that stuff. That's important. We don't want uh, the default to be tracked and in danger 
under threat. So blocking by uh, tracking by default is complex because there's no formal grammar in the web standards that says here here is the web standard for viewing a web page without being tracked, and here is the the technology for being tracked, and you can just block that cleanly. It's much more subtle. It involves all sorts of, of uh, variations on themes. It, it, it cannot, in, in fact, be formalized in such a clean way because there are always ways across a network to track somebody if you're determined enough to do so. But what we have today is such a permissive system that uh, there's, there's tons of ways to track, and fortunately for Brave, there are lots of ways to defend. Other, uh, I would say, browsers are starting to do this. For a long time, the only real protection came from browser extensions. So Firefox pioneered the extension model uh, for browsers, and then other browsers did their own um, versions of it, and Chrome's became predominant um, because of Chrome's market power. And so people can use extensions like uBlock Origin, which we think very highly of, uh, or uh, ad blocking extensions, some of which don't block tracking well at all. There are some like Ghostery and Disconnect that are uh, more about tracking protection as well. Um, the, the the diligence and degree of of protection vary among these extensions, and you have to know about extensions. You know, does the average user even know what an extension is or how to get one? With Brave, we build it right into the browser. We do something beyond that. When you do block tracking, when you block this sort of subtle mix of content that can track you, that's woven into the content you do want to read, you can break the content you want to read. You can break the experience. You can break the page. So we need our users to be literally brave. We want them to have uh, you know, some fortitude in the face of adversity because they're going to get some breakage. They're going to even get some hostile you know, dialogues from anti-ad block or anti, anti-tracking systems that publishers sometimes run. Those systems generally don't help publishers. They, they lose readers, but they're out there. Um, so by blocking all this by default, we can protect the user. Then we study the emerging threats using machine learning and web crawlers. We build uh, sophisticated models of how tracking works. These are uh, rolled up under a, a, a name we call page graph. And that allows us to automate the ongoing uh, shields that we, we ship uh, to users as a set of rules to block things. So we have a very uh, adaptive system. We can respond to threats within a day or so through a data service that our browser gets these rules through. These rules are not tracking you to us. We don't track our users in any identifiable way, but we can update Brave quickly to respond to new tracking threats. And we can quickly resolve any sort of breakage that they might see. So we're trying to push the web toward a private by default state. And that requires this kind of advanced research and development because we can then inform the web standards. So we do have a proper grammar for what is licit or legal tracking versus versus not. And then users can more easily and assuredly block the tracking. You also created the basic attention token. Why did you need a token? So we started from a position in 2015 of Brave wanting to, excuse me, block ads, block tracking really, which might block ads, but essentially we were focused on blocking tracking. When you do that, you cut off all the sort of bespoke uh, contract-based, even if it's software as a service, contract-based payments that go from the advertiser to the publisher through a bunch of tracking intermediaries, so-called third parties. We realized, therefore, we were going to hurt some publishers. And our users, our early adopters, also realized that because they, uh, they're they ecologically minded. They, they don't just want to track. They don't just want to free ride. They would like to give back, if possible, to their favorite websites and YouTube channels and so on. Uh, and you, you, once you block all those, those tracking uh, pixels and tracking scripts, the payments will not be confirmed and the publisher or creator will not get paid. So to reconnect payments, you need something like a browser payment channel directly to the creator. And cryptocurrency was on our mind from the beginning. So I talked to the Ethereum London folks in July of 2015 about doing something I called BraveCoin at the time to make it uh, possible for not only users to give back to their favorite creators, but to give users some, some coins to get them started, and maybe even as an ongoing uh, grant, almost like a 
a citizenship uh, income. Because I didn't think users should, after having been abused for decades by tracking, have to open their wallet and and somehow acquire a cryptocurrency. And that was difficult to do then. It's it's not really any a whole lot easier now. Uh, but the Ethereum uh, network had just launched in end of 2014 and was not ready. And so we turned to Bitcoin. And as we brought up Brave in 2016, we rapidly integrated Bitcoin so that you could, uh, by buying Bitcoin, send a little bit to uh, a multi-sig wallet that no uh, no entity had two or three keys control over, and that wallet would uh, ir- ir- irrevocably commit whatever you sent to it to be distributed among your sites. And we tried signing up websites to receive the Bitcoin that was being sent. We used a protocol called Anonized, the Zero Knowledge Proof Protocol, Uh, We had a centralized but blinded accounting server, so there was no link back to user identity from any of the donations that went through this mechanism, but we could settle to publishers who signed up to get their Bitcoin. And it was a beta, so we, we, we had to comply with regulations, but we didn't have any partners helping us settle, so we had to, you know, collect, um, W9s or, or, you know, uh, equivalent uh, tax uh, forms from recipients, and they had to be willing to set up a Bitcoin address and we'd send to them. This was difficult. Uh, There were many problems. The first, I will say, no offense to Bitcoin, it would have been true of any crypto. A lot of publishers don't want any cryptocurrency. The big ones, especially the legal finance department and IT department don't want to touch it. So they need something more like what they're used to with getting paid by ad vendors or Google, and that looks more like a ACH, you know, bank connection or some kind of a, a way of being invoiced and, and or getting paid on an invoice basis. They um, they wouldn't touch crypto. And so we topped out around a thousand uh, publishers signed up and it was very hard to grow f- further. Uh, but that was only on the, the settlement side, the publisher side. The users of the system had to buy their own Bitcoin and bring it. In the U.S., we had a Coinbase buy widget we integrated, which was itself a little challenging because it had to worry about fraud, credit card fraud. So it had a a sort of acquisition funnel that would study the user and take extra information, not quite, you know, uh, know your customer level information, but still enough to do uh, fraud, anti-fraud work against credit card fraud, which is a real risk. Uh, These buy widgets, you're probably familiar with this, if you want to buy $20 in Bitcoin with a credit card, the risk is credit card IDs are under a dollar in bulk on, on the dark web. So stolen credit card IDs. So somebody can just buy a bunch of stolen IDs, make a bunch of $20 Bitcoin buys. They net $19 profit or more because it only cost them a buck or less for the credit card ID that was stolen. And there's no way to, to pr- prosecute the, the chargebacks. So, uh, you know, the, whoever is involved, the 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 bank uh, of the stolen credit card uh, is going to just have to eat that, and they're going to try to shut it down. But it's it's hard to to police. Um, so Coinbase and others who have buy widgets have to do some machine learning based anti fraud, and that that makes the user experience less ideal. But even then, you're asking the user to buy Bitcoin, and we wanted users to get paid. We didn't want them to buy. Asking the user to buy something is going to lose a lot of users right right away. A lot of people just say, why should I pay? The web's already free. I can use Chrome or Firefox with uBlock Origin, which is that great uh, blocking extension I mentioned. Um, By the way, Chrome is is still planning to somehow break uh, the capabilities of uBlock Origin and other rigorous blockers in order to, they say, improve the security of their extension API. So there's a real risk that some of these blocking extensions will, will be neutered over time. But uh, then you have a, the problem I mentioned earlier, that users have to know what an extension is and how to get it, sometimes how to configure it. Uh, and, and in the end, our ecologically minded users had no way to give back. So when we set up this Bitcoin system, they could give back, but they had to learn about Bitcoin. They had to buy it. Oh, and then, of course, 2017... We had real congestion problems on Bitcoin due to the block size dispute and other problems that were not solved until SegWit was turned on uh, after a fork late in the year. And that that meant uh, the network was very slow and the fees that Coinbase was charging for a small Bitcoin buy 
were inordinate. So we had users who were not crypto savvy. And because they saw this Coinbase buy widget, if they were willing to navigate its you know, sort of anti-fraud multi-step process to get their credit card in, they would buy $5 of Bitcoin. And they would see a $4.50 fee <laughs> because the network was so congested. So uh, some of them said, okay, I'll, I'll just buy in bulk and I'll amortize the fee better. I'll buy, you know, more Bitcoin at once and I'll trickle it into my brave wallet over time. But again, you lose, every time you add friction like that, you lose users. Every time you say, oh, you know what, get a, a Bitcoin wallet that optimizes fees, you'll be fine. It'll be great. Uh, a lot of users don't know what to do. They, they just don't have the expertise and they won't acquire it. And the idea wasn't to force everyone using Brave to become a Bitcoin expert. It was to help the lead users of Brave who are switching away from Chrome, who want to get protection through Brave Shields, who want to give back to their favorite sites, some way to do so without without a lot of pain and friction and overhead well, and fees. So then basically you introduce basic attention token, but I, but just so I understand, like you were saying earlier that publishers don't want to accept a cryptocurrency. So why would they want to accept that? And like, why wouldn't you just use a stable coin? Do you know what I mean? Just keep it clean. Like if they're wanting dollars, then it can be all denominated in dollars. Uh, we're we're global. That's one reason. The dollar is is the king of the fiats, but there are places in the oh, world. Okay. Where I mean, we well, have, we, any, or whatever the local but, stable but coin answer, is of their choice. But, well, there weren't a lot of stable coins then. But to answer your question more directly, yes, publishers mostly, especially the big ones, don't want to take any crypto. But basic attention token does not require them to take any crypto. We have a partner uphold which we used from the start to do settlement and they can exchange to Bitcoin and then to any fiat and they do. So when, when we partner with Uphold in 2017, uh, right after the basic attention token sale, we had a way to, to do settlement in any currency that the, the publisher chose. And initially that was predominantly the local fiat, but as we grew, especially as we, we moved the system to support YouTube channels where you can actually tip a reward, give a recurring anonymous contribution to your favorite YouTube creator, uh, a lot of them said, we're going to keep that. And they didn't exchange out. So the, the choice of what to take in settlement was another variable. Like I said, that's a point of friction because you can't impose crypto, whether it's BAT or Bitcoin. On the other hand, you need an exchange partner to have the freedom to let people choose whatever they want and then let the market sort it out. And so to, why don't you describe how that works for the listeners? Sure. So the idea of BraveCoin that I mentioned, that I discussed in London with the Ethereum folks, was in part to create something that was not uh, a larger store value coin like Bitcoin, let's say, where there's uh, enormous speculative supply and demand pressure and fairly high volatility. We created basic attention token for a smaller tokenized market, which is the attention market that's mediated today very badly through tracking in browsers, through all these surveillance JavaScripts and images and pixels, cookies. So that market, as our white paper argues, can have price stability over time. And we also have the option, which BraveCoin, the initial idea, wanted of giving users uh, f tokens to get them started grants to bootstrap the system. And that was part of the, the basic attention token plan that came from the Genesis block of the capped token sale. Uh, and so we, we did an ERC-20 token on Ethereum. We, we had been inspired by the Golem project, in which sold in November of 2016, uh, which was very successful for its time and even more so in view of Crypto Summer and, and the run-up in Ethereum price, Ether price. Um, we also looked at other early token experiments like First Blood. And we we saw the emergence of ERC-20 as a sign to get off Bitcoin. We we have no you know religious commitment, a priori commitment to any coin. We're huge fans of Satoshi's work and we're convinced that, that crypto is here to stay, but we use it as a means to an end. And that's tokenizing the attention economy, rewarding users rather than making them pay, reducing friction for all crypto, normalizing crypto for not only attention economics as mediated by a browser or an ad bearing app like a game, but also for e-commerce and, and other things. Uh, one of the things we noticed with Bitcoin that I heard about from an Open Bazaar founder who talked to me the other month was 
it is a store of value. It is subject to these speculative and fairly volatile uh, changes in price. And therefore, people don't want to spend it generally. The Open Bazaar founder said, well, they want to hodl it. And I understand that. That also worked against our using Bitcoin. And so when we used the basic attention token, it wasn't quite a stable coin. But if you look at Willie Wu's uh, charts, uh, Wunomic, from uh, 2017, BAT was actually second least volatile above US dollar tether among a basket of tokens and coins he looked at, and Bitcoin was more volatile. Ethereum was more volatile. So we actually, as our white paper argued, did by tokenizing and using a, a custom token, we did achieve lower volatility. Uh, because we're not locking up the, the coin for a long time, we're using it uh, to settle in 30 days, we don't see volatility as a big concern, and, and we don't think our users are, are burdened by it because they're getting uh, a revenue share from ads now, private ads in the browser, which we can offer them as part of Brave Rewards. This is optional. They're getting uh, 70% of the revenue in tokens, and they can they can take it out right away. And we, we, we do the conversion at the end of the 30-day period. So we think the volatility exposure is small. Uh, but like I said, we're, we're crypto... Um, Agnostic, so we will use multiple uh, tokens we, and coins. We will use stable coins in Brave for many purposes, such as e-commerce. And we're integrating these now. You're, you're already seeing this in Brave for Desktop with an Ethereum uh, wallet that can support ETH and ERC twenty. Uh, that's already in. Uh, we're adding other main chain coins and tokens this year, uh, first half of this year. Not by adding, you know, full full nodes or custom like clients to the browser, uh, but using um, something like uh, Alchemy or BitGo. Okay, and so just to summarize for people, you know, because we need to kind of move on to different topics, but basically the way it works is that so you block um, the the ads that publishers serve up and then you insert your own private ads and users can earn money from watching those ads they get 70 percent of the revenue and if they feel like they can give some to the publishers and that's how then the publishers earn bat is that the full cycle not quite there's there's some careful wording required here we do not insert ads into web pages without publishers agreeing to it and we haven't done that yet we're working with some publishers to do so our ads are user private they go in separate spaces in the browser that belong to you, the browser user. They are not going into the publisher page. Uh, you know, that would be wrong, we think, ethically. It would also be legally gray area. And we want the publisher to get paid 70% if they are hosting the space for the ad. But we, um, we definitely uh, want the user to have their own space available. So we have a notification-based ad unit. If you click on the notification because you like the call to action. It's like a little search ad, like you see on Google search, but independent of any page, you get a separate tab with a full, beautiful tabs worth of ad content. And that is private. There's no signaling. There's no tracking by anybody, even us. It's done through local machine learning in the browser that matches against an, a fixed catalog. And again, the, the, the basic attention token lets us uh, do the, the settlement and lets us do the, the granting to the user. It lets us have a a unit of account for uh, attention. But uh, the mechanics involving the browser are equally important. People think blockchain alone can solve things like proof of humanity or anti-fraud or attention measurement. Blockchain cannot do no such thing. You have to have endpoint software like a browser. You have to harden it against fraud. You have to use secure hardware sometimes. And we're doing all of that. So our entire system is blockchain plus browser. And that's what the BAT's all about, to, to answer your question. In a moment, we're going to discuss Brave's ad platform, but first a quick word from the sponsors who make this show possible. Crypto.com sees the future of cryptocurrency in every wallet. Have you seen the MCO Visa card? Loaded with perks including up to 5% back on all your spending and unlimited airport lounge access. They pay for your Spotify and Netflix too. What's not to love? With Crypto.com, not only can you spend your crypto, but you can grow it too. Earn up to 6% per year on the most popular coins like BTC, ETH, XRP, and up to 12% per annum on stable coins. Crypto.com has recently launched its exchange and crypto fundraising platform, The Syndicate. There is a 50% off Atom listing event on February 12, 2020. Sign up on the Crypto.com exchange now. 
Will the world follow France and advocate banning privacy coins? Will government-backed stablecoins become the new fiat? Are distributed and peer-to-peer -peer exchanges just a flash in the pan? The answer is maybe. Virtual currencies can flourish and create a new, private, and more versatile economy. But that grand vision can't happen without keeping crypto clean. And that requires support of government and accountability for bad actors. Privacy-enhanced compliance using cryptographic controls has the potential to preserve anonymity without compromising legitimate investigations. CypherTrace is working on this vision of the future. Sign up to stay up to date on the Privacy-Enhanced Compliance Initiative and receive authoritative crypto AML reports quarterly. www.cyphertrace.com slash keep crypto clean. Today's episode is brought to you by Kraken. Kraken is the best exchange in the world for buying and selling digital assets. With all the recent exchange hacks and other troubles, you want to trade on an exchange you can trust. Kraken's focus on security is utterly amazing. Their liquidity is deep and their fee structure is great with no minimum or hidden fees. They even reward you for trading so you can make more trades for less. If you're a beginner, you will find an easy on-ramp from five fiat currencies. And if you're an advanced trader, you'll love their 5x margin and futures trading. To learn more, please go to kraken.com. That's K-R-A-K-E-N.com. Back to my conversation with Brendan friend and Ike of Brave. So you now have 10 million monthly active users. How many publishers do you have and who are some of the big ones? So I'm going to encourage you to see an, a new site called bat.growth. It's a new domain, bat.growth, that shows we have over 400,000 publishers signed up. Uh, and you can see the top ones there, including Wikipedia and The Guardian, The Washington Post, uh, Vice Quartz, there are many others, but also a large number of YouTube channels, some of the top ones, especially about music, uh, DJing, techno music. Um, and that that uh, uh, site, bat.growth, is only the latest iteration from a volunteer based on our, our data uh, analytics endpoint service that we run. There's an earlier one um, called batgrowth.com. So... I encourage you to look at those because these are independent sites that are showing nice charts of our growth curves for, for signing up creators, uh, YouTubers more than websites, but all of them. We also have tw Twitter users signing up in large numbers. Uh, Redditors, you can tip a Reddit post if you like it or a comment. You can tip a tweet. We take advantage of the browser. I mentioned our system is browser plus blockchain. So we actually put a tip button on every tweet in Brave and we do it safely without um, stepping on anything that's in the Twitter rendered content, without letting any security holes or cross-site scripting holes emerge from how we do it. So that, uh, that kind of tipping and, and as an entry point to the Brave reward system to using BAT has been very productive because you see a great piece of content you want to tip, that helps you get on board, and then you can start setting up recurring payments like Patreon in the browser and you can let, let some of your monthly budget of tokens flow out automatically to sites you visit that are signed up. So with over 400,000 sites, some of our users are, are actually finding their budget is well spent because most of the sites and channels they look at are signed up with us. And is Dow Jones still a partner? Because I didn't yeah. see that on a current list. Oh, they are. Okay. They are. They are. Uh, we're oh, doing something. Okay. You'll see Barron's and Market Watch. We're particularly focused on them. Uh, we're we're going to grow out from there. Uh, and on the growth side, we have 11, over 11.2 million monthly active users. We have over 3.5 million daily active users, and we're driving daily up because we want users to switch from Chrome full time. What you'll find, and, and Mozilla has numbers like this too, is when you have a browser in the modern world, especially on a uh, laptop or desktop, people use it in a mix with other browsers. And and they don't use it every day. So sometimes you get really loyal users. Sometimes you get users who dip in only for certain sites when they're thinking Brave is, is going to protect them more. But as we grow and we use the token as a reward and we uh, show greater uh, you know utility, we get our message out, we're converting people to use Brave all the time. And it really is a, a, a good upgrade from Chrome now. Since uh, about a year ago, we've had the ability to support all the Chrome extensions that you could want. 
uh, not just uh, a few we had in the previous version of our desktop product. We're, we're going to bring extensions to Android. So we're using the same uh, Chromium-based uh, core code on Android very soon as we do on desktop. And that's going to be interesting because Google has not allowed ex- browser extensions onto Chrome for Android. And that means there's no ad blocking extensions. Hmm. There's no, no uBlock origin on, on Android for Chrome. I was curious also, Brave doesn't block ads from Google or Facebook, which, you know, are not content creators. They just um, serve up content that other people create. But then the people and companies who actually are content creators do have their ads blocked, uh, you know, like the New York Times site or something. So why is that? We block tracking and scripts that are abused, abusive, like tracking scripts, uh, scripts that are tied into Google's uh, analytics, which are per their privacy policy used for tracking, get blocked. This has collateral effects. It damages first party ads. Either they don't perform or they disappear. I'll I'll take an example from a fashion site, L.com, E-L-L-E. That's a a huge ad on that front page, takes up half the lower half of the viewport. And it's a direct sold ad. It's a great ad. I've talked to Hearst about this. Uh, We have no problem with the ad itself, but unfortunately, Hearst uses Google's ad server to place it. They use Google's tags, script tags to place it, and we block those. Now, we could, and we're still working on this with publishers, just through a a few safe um, mock-ups of script uh, APIs, similar to how we do the tipping button on Twitter, we could restore that that lost uh, functionality to make that ad appear. But that ad then is a custom video carousel, and it has... Uh, another tracking partner that's part of the the surveillance capitalism uh, system, and we block them too. So we'd have to rework that to use our own anonymous confirmation uh, cryptographic protocol, and that could be done. But again, it starts to get uh, you know costly to both us and the publisher. So the collateral damage is real, and this is not something we like. But we're not going to compromise on protecting users here. We serve users first, even if it means there's some collateral damage to publishers. And this is well supported in case law. Ad ad blocking has been taken to court, especially in Germany, but elsewhere. And the user's right to block has been upheld every time. Uh, Axel Springer, in particular, has just thrown money at this in German courts and lost time after time. But I'm curious, I mean, you know, as we talked about earlier, you know, you... um, have your own ad platform, you strip out the ads that are already on a web page, you replace them, or you don't replace them, but we you, don't have, replace you them, have no. another way. Huh? We don't replace anything in the page. We we give users the opportunity to get user ads. Right. So, but you have another way of, you know, showing um, ads. Doesn't that just make you another middleman? The browser's always in the middle. This is the insight that uh, I had by living through Mozilla and realizing Firefox had become Google's middleman. And why should the browser work for the surveillance superpower instead of for its user? If you want the browser to work for you, including paying you so you can give back to your creators, then you want Brave. And and nobody's built a system like this. It could have been done, but that's not how Google evolved. They were a search engine, so they centralized data collection, which is what you do when you build search indexes. And then they they bought an ad business and grafted it on. They could have done everything we've done in Brave. The technology is is you know not unknown. The research was there on things like zero knowledge proofs and other means for doing anonymity, uh, but they didn't. We did, and we're pioneering a movement now. You see among other browsers, Apple has always blocked third party cookies, uh, but not necessarily other trackers. But now with Apple Intelligent Tracking Prevention, they are blocking tracking systematically. Uh, Mozilla has turned on tracking prevention finally. It was a real struggle to, to get that on. Uh, even when I was there, uh, we stepped away from blocking tracking three times. And so I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I think we were worried about rocking big boats, including the search partner, Google. We were worried about changing the ecosystem in a way that wouldn't make it any better. Well, Brave has a better way, and we're willing to standardize everything we do. So uh, as we work, especially in the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, Standards body, we're working with Apple, Mozilla, uh, Samsung. I, I would say Microsoft a bit. They're 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 trying with their new Chrome-based browser, Chromium-based browser, to do some kind of tracking protection. Uh, you're seeing a new normal of privacy by default, privacy by design that's turned on 
to some extent. And we turn it up to 11. So uh, that's that's why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, but you have to realize the browser is not uh, out of the middle position. It's very much in the middle position. And either it serves the user or it serves Google. There's no other way. Well, how... I so I understand what you're saying there, but then at the same time, I think if people want to participate in the Brave Rewards, they have to get an Uphold wallet, and they're, there no, they have to participate in full don't. KYC, right? No, no, they do not. No. In, no, that's incorrect. In order to join Brave Rewards, you do not need to sign up with Uphold. You do not need the KYC. The, that, that's a, a very important because we wanted the system to allow the user, with the browser serving the user, to direct their revenue share that they get from these anonymous ads back to their favorite YouTube channels and websites. And that does not require KYC. That's the default mode when you sign up for Brave Rewards. You are not told to go sign up with Uphold. You're not required to do so. The only time you would have to sign up with Uphold is if you want to take out the revenue share for your own purposes to buy you know, lunch. Uh, it's $5 a month. It's not a huge amount. A lot of our ecologically minded users want to give it back. They don't view it as, as important income to them. They could take it out, but they don't. And so the default is for it to flow back to the creators. And that's super important. And I, I think there's been misinformation about this. There's been some sort of association of KYC with the basic attention token, but that's also false because any three-sided market like the ad market, which has advertisers, publishers, and users, is going to re require revenue shares. And even if you tried to do this on chain with a smart contract, the latest guidance from May from last year from FinCEN, the Department uh, of the Treasury Agency, says you need a license as a money services business or a money transmitter. So that is why we use Uphold. We are not in trying to defy any regulators here. We want to be compliant. And Unfortunately, even with a smart contract, with decentralized uh, revenue shares through a smart contract, uh, FinCEN, and I think the SEC agrees in the Ether Delta case, says if you're doing something that looks like a custodial smart contract, th the entity that deployed that contract has to have a license. So we use Uphold and we use anonymity tech. And as we migrate on chain, we'll have to figure out who's going to deploy the contract, who has the license. But this idea that BAT requires KYC is false. It's a canard. And in fact, any crypto asset that we use, whether it's a stable coin or Bitcoin, through this revenue share split that advertising inevitably imposes, will require a compliant solution like we use with Uphold if the user is to get paid. But again, our model is not that the user must take the tokens out for their own you know, extra change in their pocket. It's to give back to the creators. And that's what the ecologically minded users Early on, wanted. They told us before we even did the Bitcoin prototype, they said, I never click on an ad, but I know that there's a cost per impression, so called ad model, or an ad impression, a view. Like in, in Facebook's model, two seconds of a quarter of a video player reaching your eyeballs makes a, a brand impression on you. And somehow there's some money flowing, you know, fractions of a penny. So I want to make up for the damage I do. I love Brave, but I'm, I know I'm blocking some cost per impression ads. Can I give back? And that's what the default for Brave Rewards is. If you join, the ads are enabled, they're private and anonymous, and the, the tokens go under your direction back to your creators. And you can tip, you can set up fixed uh, recurring manual contributions, and you can let the rest sort of sweep out through automatic contributions based on in browser analytics of what sites you've been to. So basically they'll earn um, basic attention token from watching ads. And then as long as they don't try to cash out the money for themselves, they don't have to go through KYC. It's only if they, if they want to cash out. Or if they want to add their own funds, that's the other direction that, that the governments regulate. So taking money out or adding your own funds in puts you in under anti-money laundering a regulation, and that's why we use Uphold. But if you're just participating without adding funds or taking out funds, then you're okay, and there's no KYC at all. All right. Um, when you did your ICO, you sold $36 million worth of that in 24 seconds. And I'm quoting your PR person here. She said it was to around 210 buyers 
which maybe <laughs> because she didn't say specifically 210 means maybe more than 205, but less than 210. So what would you have done differently with the ICO? Uh, so we did it in a, a period when we had excellent advice from Perkins Cooey on the legal front and uh, on accounting from Deloitte. And we complied with all the relevant laws. But the one thing that was uh, out of our hands was Ethereum. And there was no way to do sort of a, a fair crowd sale on Ethereum. We figured that because gas, uh, which is the fee built into Ethereum, was designed to arbitrate um, contention in the network fairly, it would not have exponential growth. It would it would scale linearly with the load. That we should just use gas to moderate the sale. Uh, we didn't know how fast the sale would go. There was a lot of uncertainty, uh, and so we ended up uh, just doing a capped sale, and it sold very fast, quicker than we thought. And other projects looking at that tried to do other things. They tried to say, well, we'll, we'll write a, a complex smart contract to um, you know, make the sale more fair, or we'll just raise the cap so there's more opportunity for more buyers to get in before the sale ends. You saw Status and Bancor and Tezos all go very big. Uh, they all had, I think, troubles uh, by going so big. We didn't go big, but we had a sale that ended quickly. And I actually... Uh, tweeted at Vitalik Buterin about this, and he wrote a nice blog post uh, a month or so later about token sales and how to make them better on Ethereum. But it was he—he he was very clear. He said you couldn't do much better than the Bat sale did right now. Here are some ideas for improvements, but they need more work. And uh, so I think we played it safe and did the right thing. If we had done something novel to try to make the sale slower or more fair there's a huge risk it would have failed or had a big security bug. You may recall there was the parity multi-sig wallet attack later, uh, late in July, I think in 2017. There were a number of, of serious problems uh, with wallet security, even after the famous DAO attack of 2016. So our we kept our smart contracts very simple. We had them audited by three auditors, and we avoided any any risk there and had a very fast sale, and that was the trade-off. Is it possible now to use basic attention token without using Brave? Sure, it was always possible. The minute the sale was over, the token was on Ethereum as an ERC-20 token and could be used. And early on, some... What you mean, when you say that, do you mean traded or like could could it have been earned? Or Well, not earned, but traded and used to donate back. So somebody in Germany, I think he was a student or a young young person, built an extension for Firefox and Chrome that used basic attention token, used our anonymous uh, accounting server to let people buy um, uh, tokens and send them back. It was called Batify. You may be able, it may be out there still. It only had a, a couple of dozen users because, again, without the extra work we do with advertising and anti-fraud, we couldn't give out tokens to the Batify users. But he, this person wanted to create an extension for those who would have their own bat or buy their own bat to give back. And so that Batify extension was a second uh, app in our, our ecosystem uh, very early on. Again, I, I don't think it was going to do well because making people buy crypto is, is a high uh, cost. It's a high friction uh, surface and it's not our model. We want to give users tokens, give them the option on tokens, let's say, that they can then let flow back to their creators. Or if they want, they can sign up and take out. They can add their own funds. If they if they really don't like ads, they can turn off the ads that are uh, part of Brave Rewards, the anonymous Brave ads, but leave on the anonymous contribution and they can bring their own funds through Uphold and let them trickle back to their creators, do tipping, do manual contributions. So we have a lot of flexibility for users, but the default has to be something that doesn't require the user to buy crypto because that is just a negative for, for most people. And so, but did you say that there is not a way to earn that without interacting with Brave? Right now, because of the ad deals we're doing and the anti-fraud uh, system we're doing, you have to use Brave, but we have on our roadmap for the third phase of BAT development, uh, building an SDK that can be put in other apps. Again, I, I mentioned earlier, blockchain cannot solve anti-fraud. It cannot prove there's a human on the other end of a network. Uh, blockchain cannot by itself deal with uh, uh, paying uh, a revenue share to users 
without regulated uh, compliant uh, you know, flow of some sort, whether it's through a smart contract on chain or through a centralized service like uh, we run or with Uphold, if you're doing anything that's regulated like that, you're going to need, need something more than blockchain. And so what, what is that something? Well, in part, it's client software. It's what I call endpoint software. It's in the Brave browser right now, but it can be put in a, in a defensive software development kit, so-called SDK, really a library with some hardware hardening and defense against tampering. And that can be put in other apps. And that's on our roadmap. And we have other apps, browsers, games, podcast apps that want this because they all are tired of, of the, the miserable revenue share they get from ads. Uh, a lot of them, the browsers are beholden to Google for search revenue deals. They would love to have their own way of making money in a more direct model like we have in Brave. So bringing the model we're proving in Brave to other apps is on our roadmap, but it is not something that you can do overnight because it involves, like I said, making a defensive library out of our bat code and making it fraud proof and then providing it for other apps in a way that they can integrate. In the last year, we've seen the SEC focus on tokens that meet the four prongs of the Howey test which is to be an investment contract in a common enterprise with an expectation of profits dependent on a third party. So, you know, if we're talking about how at the moment, in order to earn bad, you have to use Brave. Do you think that basic attention token could meet the Howey test? And if so, you know, is, does that give you any concern? No, I'm not going to play lawyer. Uh, I pay enough real bills to them, but we have no concerns. We complied at the time we did the sale and we've never had any problems uh, and we've been compliant ever since. So uh, as the as the guidance changes, you have to uh, read it and understand it. And I think Kin got in big trouble because they didn't respond to the Dow Bulletin of July, late July 2017. They didn't seem to take that into account in their later sale. But we have always kept current, so we don't have concerns, but I'm not going to play lawyer on, on your show because I think that would be bad for me and for the listeners. Uh, and I'd need to be paid a lot more if I were a lawyer. I, I think I've never been about money, but uh, I'm an engineer by training, and uh, I've learned a lot about business over the years. And the one thing I do know is to get the best. So Perkins Coie has been our, our great counsel on this. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's not only kick, but then you probably saw the recent news about Telegram, which is apparently in a battle with the SEC. They did issue a notice where they tried in pretty much every way possible to separate the company from the TUN network and the Graham's cryptocurrency, even to the point of saying that TUN, the TUN wallet will not be integrated with the Telegram messenger service. So, um, you know, obviously now you're in this phase where your network is um, more centralized. You know, do you have plans to like speed up your efforts to become more decentralized? And, and what it, will it look like when you do become more decentralized? Well, the parts that are very decentralized for us already are the browser pieces. Even though it's all brave, it's open source, and we have this Batify extension, which does part of what uh, the endpoint does in brave. And as I say, we're working on the SDK, but I don't think we're going to speed up. I think we're already, in some ways, we're grandfathered from the past. The problem for Telegram or new, you know, new sales or recent sales is that they they came out after further guidance and clarification and actual frameworks from the regulators. And if they didn't take those into account, then there's no sort of ex post facto uh, law protection. Uh, retroactive law protection. So that's their problem, not ours. We are uh, uh, diligently working to decentralize in this third Apollo phase. We're using the U.S. space program as a trope, the BAT Apollo phase of our roadmap. And we're looking at uh, you know future options on Ethereum. We're looking at other chains too, but we're not looking to change chains if we don't have to. And you know the, the difficulty, I think, for uh, newer projects is that they have to, to do things in a different order in order to operate in the U.S. Now, there is something I will comment on here, and that's the U.S. is, I think, of two minds on crypto. You see this most clearly with Libra, where there's um, obviously a confounding variable. There's a lot of antipathy toward Facebook, which I understand based on their data breaches and their privacy policies and, and Cambridge Analytica. But uh, when the government is is very much against Libra and there's there's spillover effects on other crypto, when 
in, in in contrast, in Asia or in other, in some ways, the rest of the world, you can do aggressive crypto projects and get uptake quickly. The innovation is moving out of the U.S. and this is not an original point. I, uh, many people have said this over the last few years, and I think it's it's uh, it's to the detriment of the U.S. that this this happens. I, I think the regulators are mostly doing their job, which is good, but. Uh, what is their job? That's defined by the legislature and the legislature outside of the state of Wyoming seems um, not to be pro crypto. So can you describe a little bit more of what it will look like when it's decentralized? Is it going to be the kind of thing where people can use other browsers and earn bad or I, I don't. As I said, there's a, if we build an SDK and the other browsers put it in, then yes, if we uh, con- combine forces that way, it will be good because it'll bring advertisers at greater scale. They'll have uh, multiple options for uh, compiling their offers into the, the catalog that our browser downloads that is the way we avoid tracking on, on and targeting on ads. So getting other browsers on board is, is generally good for the ecosystem. We want to do that. That's for the SDK side. For what's on-chain and for how you settle, Well, we our white paper talked about a, a revenue split on-chain in a smart contract, and we need to shield identity with zero knowledge proofs. And we would, per FinCEN, we would need to have a regulated entity to deploy that smart contract. So there's no uh, simple answer here, but it looks more like a side chain, maybe a proof of authority side chain, which is what we're researching in the Bat Apollo project right now. It looks like uh, putting our blind signature cryptography or zero knowledge proofs on chain in a way that can't be linked to the user, but is authentic and can be checked uh, this involves more cryptography than zero knowledge proofs, and in fact, we've we've moved toward blind signatures, which you may know of through Privacy Pass. We've also, because we want to allow advertisers and publishers to check the chain to believe us, not to trust us, or have an auditor for us, or a, a verified partner check us. Checking the chain means something like partial homomorphic encryption multi-party computing, we're looking at a large uh, crypto toolkit. So it's not just uh, blind signatures or ZKPs, it's also MPC and uh, PHE. And and that that means we're, we're doing advanced cryptography on chain, uh, on a side chain probably for, for throughput and other reasons. Um, so that's that's where we're headed with Bat Apollo, but it's it's not set in stone, it's experimental. And br- we're bringing up, you know, basically test uh, running tests and bringing up what might become a, a sidechain test net uh, for this. Uh, how it looks to the user is they just see more apps with the basic attention token integrated through the SDK. What it looks like to the advertiser is they get more reach. They can reach all the Firefox users. They can reach all the Samsung browser users. What it looks like to the publishers, publishers are already seeing ad blocking rising over the last 15 or 14 years since Adblock, Adblock Plus broke out as Firefox extensions. Uh, and they they can't do much about it uh, if it's 30% of their monthly uniques. Uh, they'd love to turn it around. That'd be a 43% win. But you can't nag Adblock users to, to whitelist your site or subscribe. That generally drives them away. So Brave is the best option for diligent, let's say, tracking protection users and Adblock users for publishers who want to recover some revenue because then they, they aren't alienating their users by saying, go away or turn off your ad blocker or, or pay us a subscription. Uh, you're saying, hey, you're using Brave. Great. Uh, maybe you have some tokens you can send us. Here's a premium product you might like to buy. One click buy, uh, low friction, no identification. Now, the publishers sometimes say, but what about my my need for subscribers with whom I have a credit card and email relationship? And we understand that. We don't want to reduce that conversion, but that conversion is 2% or less on those paywalls. You're probably seeing a lot of these paywalls now that say, hey, you've had your three free articles, time to pay. They have miserable conversion. We could actually help improve the conversion by instead of driving users away with a hostile dialogue, say, hey, you've got some bat. Why don't you spend it to buy a few more articles? And then, hey, you've bought uh, three more articles, three times. You bought nine articles, and you've overpaid compared to a monthly subscription. You're better off subscribing. How about it? At that point, we think the subscription conversion goes up. And if we have more browsers with the bad SDK, we have more uh, ad buyers for scale uh, funding the, u- the user wallets, then I think the whole system will perform better, and publishers will come around in in, in bulk. But again, when you when you go build a system like Brave, you're you're going to have to pick your 
first constituency, and ours is the user. So publishers have to follow, and I think they are. That's why we have the working relationship with Dow Jones Media Group and other publishers who signed up that you see at bat.growth. So based on the number of Etherscan wallets and the number of Vave wallets, at least a recent report said that only 4% of Brave browsers monthly active users are using bat. So yeah, that's an error because they don't, they don't look at upholds uh, wallet architecture. As I say, we use uphold not only as a money services business for regulatory reasons, but they provide a member to member off chain sending capability. And so that's what is how, the percentage then? Uh, so we have uh, over 13% of our, uh, users opted into Brave Rewards. And so that's... Uh, and, and what percentage of those are paying That's publishers? over uh, 1.4 million users. Well, the default is that they, they get ad revenue and it trickles back to their publishers. So almost all of them, very few of them turn off ads. We actually don't, because we're a privacy browser, we don't have detailed telemetry on our users. We don't want to track our users. If we took too many bits of information from our users, we could form a tracking identifier or a fingerprint. So what we know are certain, you know, very few bit answers to questions that we do measure. And we haven't studied that closely, but most users just stick with the defaults. This is a rule in all apps, certainly in browsers, that if you pick the right defaults, the users stick with them. This is why Google search is the default for Firefox. If you made it Yahoo search, which they did, people would override it back to Google. So our default for Brave Rewards is that it goes back, the ad revenue comes to the user, but they let it trickle back to their site. So uh, apart from the the, uh, the fee we take, that that's all going back to the creators. So then what if, if I'm a publisher, um, based on like if I were to compare how much I'm losing from the ad blocker on Brave versus how much I'm earning from the 13% of users who who pay publishers, then am I back in the black? That's a great question. And it requires a, a case study with a publisher, which we're working on. You can't uh, generalize the numbers easily because there are a lot of black boxes here. Not only the publisher's uh, business, which is uh, their business. It's not public generally how much they're making off their users, but also there's Google in the mix, which we block. So we, we don't know the opportunity cost of blocking, but users have the right to block. So the, the user is going to block anyway. What Brave represents is a positive sum game, found money, a good day compared to just blocking. Pure blocking is just a negative for the publisher. With Brave, there's tokens trickling back. And we're driving that 13% up. When we had uh, Brave Rewards in the desktop only, we had 40% opt-in. As we brought it to mobile, because mobile is more challenging, smaller viewport, uh, you know, one app at a time, we had the opt-in go down, but we're going to drive it back up. And so the 13% is blended. So the opt-in on desktop is higher. I would also add desktop users are more valuable. People say, you know, mobile killed desktop. It's not true. Desktop is immortal. It's a large part of Google's business. It's still important even to Facebook, which is definitely a mobile first company. Uh, so you, you look at people who are high value uh, consumers and even producers, they use a big screen laptop. They have a, even a desktop at home. They use smartphones and they use them all. Brave is an opportunity to reach them on all their devices in a private way. And in fact, we can do things that are illegal under the European data protection laws, like cross-device attribution, where you're researching a major purchase, like a car on your home big screen. And then you go on the go and you see a car you like and you look it up on your smartphone. Tracking uh, ad tech tries to look at this journey because it's a very valuable a thing to follow. And if you get the user close to buying, you can tilt them with a discount or a brand they hadn't heard of to buy differently. But it's totally surveillance. With Brave, it can all be done on your device. If you use our private sync system, it's encrypted with a key only you have. And so each browser's machine learning agent can study the, the sum of all your data that's privately encrypted and shared across your devices. That we're building out. That's not there yet. But that's that's just an idea uh, that gives you an idea of how much we can do by using this private approach that Google and the big tracking companies have trouble doing because of not only laws, but things like uh, cookies not working well on mobile. So we have a solution we think is actually more accurate and complete. It, it, it's more private by design and it's user first. So we we touched on some of the things that you're working on for this year. What else does Brave have planned for 2020? 
So the, the Bat Apollo work is important. Uh, adding crypto assets of different kinds that I mentioned is important. We we don't want to force users to use crypto. As I say, a lot of users don't really want to jump into the deep end of the crypto pool. But there are users uh, of Brave who do have crypto and want to spend it. Not not really Bitcoin, which they're hodling, but uh, stable coins or other assets. And, th- and that we want to add. So we have the ability with our scale to bring crypto to a, a level of use that you don't see outside of Korea, where if you have millions of Brave users opted in, which I think is a reasonable number over the next six months, they can not only use the basic attention token, they can, if they have other crypto assets or if they want to trade BAT through Uphold or other partners we can add, they will be able to use stable coins, they'll be able to use uh, whatever crypto asset they want. And we'll have the the infrastructure for them to do so. This this is not just about advertising. This goes to e-commerce. This can help merchants who suffer from the high cost of chargebacks, credit card fraud, which is a concealed cost on the merchant. Uh, it's it's also, by the way, going to get rid of the interchange charge, which with credit cards is like 2%. Uh, so crypto is important for, uh, we think, e-commerce. And we can make it safe and secure in the browser. One of the things Netscape uh, did that Mosaic pioneered, but Netscape really brought to fruition with secure sockets, HTTPS, and with um, the ability to do secure connections is normalizing doing business on the web. And unfortunately, we didn't have Bitcoin then. We didn't have blockchain then. But now we do. So we think payments should be completely frictionless uh, if you have crypto assets, we can even match make through an exchange. You could have a local um, buying wizard in the browser that's helping you do the best uh, exchange options. If you have to match make between an asset you have and a digital asset the merchant wants, there's so much to do here that could be automated and could just work beautifully for the user and the merchant, and get all the intermediaries who are taking their you know cuts while they tolerate fraud out of the picture. So what we're doing at scale with ads also applies to transactional models, e-commerce. And this is good for the merchants. They aren't just commodified in Amazon and then replaced by ripoff artists. It's good for the brands who have a direct relationship with our user ads in a notification and a tab with their users, their fans. So we want to build up not just ads, but long-lived brand engagement channels. If I get a Brave ad I like, I sometimes leave that tab around and I use it to interact. I may even go so far as to buy through that tab. So it becomes an e-commerce opportunity for the advertiser. We're all about direct relationships, getting rid of the indirection in the current system, which evolved opportunistically based on low-level things like the cookie, the image, and JavaScript. If we can make direct connections authentic and low-fraud and frictionless, I think everybody does better. It's a rising tide. It's a positive sum game. Even ads are better. But if you don't like ads, you can bring your own funds and uh, you, you have fewer fees taken out in the middle and you have much less fraud. Where can people learn more about you and Brave? So Brave.com is uh, the big site and at Brave on Twitter, uh, basicattentiontoken.org is the project page. And we still... Uh, mirror blogs and we do some custom uh, work there, especially around research. Uh, But I'm active on Twitter and we're very approachable. One of the things I learned at Silicon Graphics in my youth was uh, engineers doing customer support is a good idea. That's what Jim Clark had us do. So I would sit on the help desk a day a month. And so we are very responsive across the org. You can reach engineers, you can reach product people, you can reach uh, everybody at Brave uh, who has a Twitter account, and they're pretty responsive. And this is huge for early adopters because with Google Chrome or with Apple Safari, you just get no dial tone. They're just they're not going to talk to you. Uh, but there are always bugs. There are always peculiar things that happen with software. So we're we're there to help. Great. Well, thanks for coming on Unchained. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about Brendan and Brave, check out the show notes inside your podcast player. If you're not yet subscribed to my other podcast, Unconfirmed, which is shorter, a bit newsier, and now features a short news recap, be sure to check that out. Also, find out what I think are the top crypto stories each week by signing up for my email newsletter at unchainedpodcast.com. Unchained is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Factual Recording, Anthony Yoon, Daniel Ness, Josh Durham, and the team at CLK Transcription. Thanks for listening.